On the Spot brings you Maritime Montage. Last fall, we set out on a somewhat unusual quest to try to pin down the special qualities that make Maritimers so distinct from other Canadians. Our first contact was with a couple of hardy Canso fishermen. They spoke, not bitterly, but with salty humor about the hungry twenties before this so-called Antigonish movement came along to help them. This movement was a form of adult education promoted by Dr. M. M. Cody of St. Francis Xavier University. And the purpose was to better the lot of not only uh, fishermen, but farmers and miners as well. Maritimers have a great spirit of independence. And this movement capitalized on this by encouraging them to do their own buying and selling on a group basis, cooperatively. The result was credit unions, dairies, fish plants, libraries, and new homes. But first, let me take you to our meeting with Davy and Eddie Power, and a little later to the Maritimer who started the movement. Hello, this is Fred Davis speaking to you from about two miles off the east coast of Nova Scotia, near Cape Canso. That's the most easterly point of the Nova Scotia mainland. Over here in the next boat are Eddie and Davy Power. That's Eddie in the bow. He's been handlining for about 64 years now, ever since the days of sail. Eddie, what are you fishing for there? Cutfish. Cod. That's a cod there, eh? Cod. I noticed some others in there. What, what do you call them? Pollock. Pollock. Oh? How deep do you have to go for them, Eddie? What is for Pretty five or six fathoms, I'd say. That deep, eh? Yeah. What about getting up in the morning? How early do you have to get out here? Get out as early as you can. Get up till four o'clock. Four o'clock in the morning? Yeah. Don't they bite as well in other parts of the day? Sometimes they may. They usually supposed to bite better early in the morning. Well, thanks very much, Eddie. We'll be seeing you later. I guess there's no harder way of earning a living. But I haven't met a fisherman down here yet who would trade it for all the money in Toronto. You see, it's more than just a means of making a living down here. It's a way of life. Canso is a fishing village. The usual street runs along the water's edge, lined with the homes of the fishermen. Their boats find anchorage in the sheltered bay. There's the usual church and school and small hospital. But the place we're going is just down at the foot of the hill. This is the Eastern Cooperative Fisheries. This is where Eddie Power markets his fish. Like a lot of other fishermen here, he also owns a few shares in the plant. It wasn't always like that, but Eddie should be tied up at the wharf by now. Let's go down. Hello, Eddie. Fish? No, I don't want any fish. I want you for a few minutes. Have you got some spare time? Yes. Well, let's go over here and get comfortable. I'd like to hear some of your famous yarns. They're not <laughs> I tell you, Eddie, um, I wonder if you could tell me, um, let's go back a few years. Can you recall just what things were like here years ago before the uh, Antigonish movement started? Uh, I can give you an instant there that of a boat crew making 80 sharing, they call it sharing, what each man has to take home, $80 each for the season. Is that so? For one you had to live on that for the year then? The whole season. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next year they made 180. Well, after that time became a little better, we, we uh, Dr. Cody from down here and uh, started to uh, well, I want to say, yeah, educators, I might say, mm -hmm. learned different things, and we got going on our own. I see. And uh, we commenced shipping a few fish on our own to Montreal and different places. We got some little better returns. 
Well, then the year after that, I think, is the year that we, we, we couldn't sell them at all in the early season. We had to get the, uh, the uh, member for the county to come down here and buy them, William Duff. Well, I think that was about the grimmest of the, uh, the times as far as the price of fish went. But it'd be an awful hard thing for me to recall offhand of the, uh, some of the uh, things I've seen. I've known of men going fishing with no breakfast on a great many occasions. Is that so? Nothing to eat. Simply go without anything to eat. And how long would they stay out there? Probably six or eight hours or more. And nothing with them to eat? No, I had nothing to take with them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> no, that's happened on a good many occasions. And, uh... The boats got worn out, and the nets they had for catching fish got worn out. Everything went down. It must have been awfully uh, difficult with the children, then, to try to feed them and clothe them. But very hard. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, it'd be, I'm pretty near impossible. There was one old fellow here, Dr. Thompson, asked him how, uh, how much it cost him to live. And he told me he didn't know. He had never made enough. <laughs> that was one good answer. I should say it was. Yeah. Well, I notice uh, Davy over here, he doesn't seem to want to get in on the act. Davy, what have you got to say about the cooperative? You're a, an old cooperator from way back, aren't you? I've been a member of the cooperative for 20 years. Up toward now, just your fishing part of the game, this uh, processing part of it, and the crucial end of it. I've been president of the local credit union for a good many years, and secretary of the cooperative in the store over here. Len, how do you feel about uh, the advent of the credit union and the anti-condition movement generally? Oh, well, they're a great help to common people, especially the poor, the poorer people. Mm-hmm. Well, if you want to get the background, this is recommending you go see Dr. Cody. He knows that from mean to end and tell you all about it. And uh, I'm very grateful to you, gentlemen, for your time, and I'd like to wish you lots of luck in the future with your fishing. Thank you very much. Man. You're very well. Anytime you want to go fishing, come down. We'll take you. Thanks, I will. Someday when it's not blowing quite so hard. Wherever you go in the Maritimes, or in the world for that matter, wherever the words Antigonish movement are known, you'll hear the name Moses Matthias Cody. Often you'll hear it spoken with something akin to awe, and not without good reason. Dr. Cody and his two cohorts, A.B. McDonald and Father Jimmy Tompkins, became legendary characters 25 years ago. It was they who coaxed, cajoled, and browbeat a uh, despondent and beaten people into action with the magic word cooperation back in those bitter days of the 30s. McDonald and Tompkins are dead now. Dr. Cody is retired, or as retired as a human dynamo can be. He still has an office at St. FX. He still lectures, and he still inspires people to attempt the impossible. And he looks much younger than his 72 years. We'll go over to his office now, where you'll meet him. At a distance, Antigonish looks like an average, placid, rural community. But actually, it's the focal point for a great mass experiment. For here in the early 30s was conceived a daring, magnificent plan, that of educating a large part of the adult population of the maritime provinces to lift themselves by their own bootstraps from economic dependence on others to control of their own fortunes. Nerve center of the Antigonish movement was, and still is, St. Francis Xavier University, a small college with a great man to head their noble experiment, Dr. M. M. Cody, a Cape Bretoner born and bred. Oh, Mr. Davis, come in. Sit down. What can I do for you? Well, Doctor, I'd like a very short course on your brand of philosophy. Well, uh, I'm not very strong on uh, brevity, but I shall try. Where should I begin? Uh, Could you tell me just how you um, uh, devised the thinking of the Antigonish movement? What was the philosophy behind it? Well, our fundamental uh, philosophy is that the best way to help people is to have them help themselves. We conceive it to be our role to organize and educate the people to the point where they're able to do that. But we help them uh, much more in the second place by supplying the dynamics for doing this. And uh, 
we taught them philosophy in the first instance, in any case. We, we tried to show them that life meant the release and guidance of human energy. That that's all is true life. In other words, that a people will be great in proportion to what they do. If they do great things, they will be great. If they release their energies and worthwhile activities, they will finally arrive at the point where they will have a, uh, a great civilization. That's the story of man, man at his best in, in human history. Well then, Doctor, you feel that every working man should also be a businessman. That's right. And we think that the techniques are right at hand by which he can come in. Private, a private enterprise, too, uh, that through uh, the credit unions and the various types of group action in the field of money, in the field of business, in the field of processing and marketing, and in the field of services. Human beings, when properly educated, and working by the cooperative technique, can enter this wonderful field of business. And they can pipe down to themselves a fair share of the national income which they all have to create. And they can also, by doing this, improve their, their, their minds and their hearts, and they will become better citizens. I don't think there's anything I could say that would provide a, a better ending to my trip here, Doctor. Uh, I'd like to thank you for everything, and it's been a great pleasure meeting you. Well, we learned from Eddie Power that things were pretty rough in the Maritimes back in the 20s, and Dr. Cody gave us an idea of the philosophy that helped change this situation. Now I'd like you to meet Mr. J.E. O'Mara, economist with the Federal Department of Agriculture. Mr. O'Mara, uh, you're a graduate of uh, St. Francis Xavier, aren't you? That's right. Well, in your present position, you'd certainly be familiar with cooperatives generally. Uh, would you tell us just what happened in the Maritimes as a result of this Antigonish movement? Well, Fred, I think it's fair to say that the Antigonish movement definitely affected the lives of a quarter of a million or a half a million people in the Maritimes through the credit unions, the cooperative societies, the marketing cooperatives, and the fish cooperatives. And did this idea spread to other parts of the country? Yes, the uh, idea of credit unions definitely spread to other parts of the country, but you must remember, too, that uh, there were cooperatives and credit unions in Canada long before the Antigonish movement. The Antigonish movement took the credit unions to British Columbia and Ontario, but Quebec had credit unions back in 1900. Oh. Now, you've worked with Dr. Cody. Uh, how was it he was able to uh, convince people that, that these ideas and philosophies uh, were practical? Well, Fred, as you know, Dr. Cody was a great spellbinder on a platform. He could convince people uh, that what he said was true and needed. And he used the study club technique uh, to get people to study their own problems right in their own community. And at one time, they had almost a thousand of these study clubs with 10,000 people working in them. How did he make out for staff? He couldn't uh, attend them all. Well, the, the department operated on the principle that if you got people together in these study clubs, you would throw up your own leaders who would take over and do the work of the limited staff that was available at Antigonish. Uh, I can tell you a story about one of these leaders who in his part-time was a rum runner. And uh, as all rum runners do, eventually he ran afoul of the law and ended up in the local jail. And uh, A.B. McDonald was on his way to Cape Britain one day and stopped in to see this boy in the jail. And the greeting he got from him was, well, I'm glad to see you. Will you please send me some pamphlets and literature because I've got a study club going in here. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. O'Mara, for telling us more about cooperatives. While we were down in the Maritimes last fall, uh, we decided, of course, that the trip wouldn't be complete without a visit to Prince Edward Island, and we wanted to take in a small country fair near Summerside. And while we were in that area, the question of cooperatives came up again. This is my friend Fred. I want you to meet uh, Mr. Rick Poirier, the manager of the Co-op Union. How do you do, sir? How do you do, sir? Now, Mr. Poirier will tell you more about this organization than I do myself. Fine. I've heard quite a bit about the fishermen's cooperatives, Mr. Poirier. Uh, oh, yes. How long has this been in existence here? Well, since 1934. 
Oh. At Mon Carmel. And here has been uh, organized in 1942. Mm -hmm. Are you a fisherman yourself, no. Manager? You're just, no. the, they're just the boss, are That's you? That's right. <laughs> so they called me a ton. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Uh, Charles was telling me that uh, some of the farmers in this vicinity do fishing. That's very unusual. Uh, some of them do. Uh, not all, but uh, some of them that uh, supplement the fishing uh, for an income. Oh? But uh, well, how long? Is it very long, the fishing season? Well, it starts about the first part of May, and then um, it goes on from the month of May for herring, then uh, the month of June for mackerel, and then the months of August and September for lobsters. Oh. And during the rest of the time, the, fish, the farmers work at, the, at the, their crops, look, taking care of their crops. And, so they're landlubbers for part of the year and uh, sailors for the rest that's of the right. year, right? Eh? Yeah, that's right. But now, Rick, I want to take Mr. Fred up to the exhibition ground to see how they're getting along there. Well, make sure that he doesn't run away with some of our nice-looking girls up there. Oh, that's a pleasant idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Mr. Poirier. You're quite welcome. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Egmont Bay, Mont Carmel, I found out, was settled from France in 1758. There are only about 350 families in the area. All of them, except one lone English family, which has just settled there, speak a dignified old world style of French. But they had no difficulty understanding my brand of Upper Canadian. This year was the 50th anniversary of their fair, and they approached it with an exuberance which the Canadian National Exhibition might envy. Since every man is a natural jack of all trades, there were plenty of willing hands to put up all the installations necessary for such a program. There was no lack of expert help either, if any competitor asked for it. Hello there, boys. Hello. Good afternoon. And this is Dionel, one Hello. of our 4-H members. Mm -hmm. And these boys are from the Department of Agriculture, teaching this young lad how to trim the scarf and keep it in, put in shape for tomorrow's fair. Oh. Just what does this 4-H stand for? Well, this is part of our 4-H club now, the CAF. It's to promote greater interest in our rural youth. Uh-huh. Um, is this your uh, power supply for the clipping operation here? Yes. Mm -hmm. We're actually not as antiquated as it looks. We, <laughs> we just don't happen to have electricity in this area. Oh, I see. Yes. So this is sort of a temporary measure, is it? Yes, it is. I imagine that's quite a technique, isn't it, using those clippers on an animal like that? Yes, I would say so. Well, just why is it necessary? Oh, you might say for the same reason uh, you would get a haircut or a woman puts on lipstick. Oh, strictly for show, is that's it? That's right. <laughs> well, lots of luck tomorrow, dear Al. Prince Edward Island, with its mild, year-round climate, is one of Canada's best regions for raising all kinds of stock. Some years ago, a flock of North Country and Cheviot sheep were imported to improve the local breeds, so that today, prize sheep are as important to exhibitors as choice cattle. No matter what the job, whether it was grooming a cow for competition or raising a chicken coop, these people displayed a quiet pride in their work. Let's see, are the people that live in this French community here, are they direct descendants of those original settlers? No, because after the expulsion, these people came from France and settled on the island here. Oh, I see. Yes. I noticed uh, uh, there's a great similarity in, uh, in names here in this community. There's a lot of uh, uh, the Arsenault family and a lot of the Gallants. Now, are they all related? Well, I suppose they come from the same root, but uh, they are not related to, uh, closely together, you know. That would be many generations oh, yes, ago. Yes. Right? certainly doing a good job getting the fair ready for tomorrow. I guess they're just about ready, aren't they? Yes, now the only thing we need is a fine day. No rain, and it'll be a success. I hope so. Yes, gentlemen, are we all ready for the big fair? 
tomorrow. What about the ground? Is it all ready? Yes, I guess everything is ready. I had men working outside there, there, putting up the stuff. Mrs. Arsenault, has the uh, meeting started yet? Yes, everybody is here. Come on in. Thank you. This is uh, Mr. Fred Davis, who is going to be our guest visitor tomorrow. I wish to introduce him to you. He's a Mr. Cyrus P. Galland, the president of the organization. Mr. Silver Arsenault. How do you do, Mr. Arsenault? Mr. Philip R. Arsenault. How do you do, sir? Mr. Camille Arsenault. Yes. How do you do, Mr. Arsenault? Mr. Zeno Galland. Nice to meet you, Mr. Galland. Mr. Uh, Victor Arsenault. How do you? Mr. Uh, Edmund Arsenault. Mr. Arsenault. And Mr. Uh, Eric Arsenault. How do you do, sir? And uh, Mr. Leo Bernard. Nice to meet you. How do you do, Mr. Bernard? Are you sure his name is Bernard, are you? Yes, I'm sure. How did you happen to get in here, Just Mr. Bernard? Just <laughs> luck. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's quite a job to get the exhibition going, I suppose. Well, I guess I'm going down to the ground and see what's going on. Well, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, Mr. Bernard. Fine. I hope everything will be ready. I hope so. I'm sure well, we'll see you tomorrow around the canteen, I hope. Okay, Mr. Rodney. Maybe a little drop around. All right, fine. We'll be seeing you at the fair Okay, goodbye, Mr. Bernard. Goodbye, Mr. Bernard. We'll see you at the big canteen. Goodbye, Mr. Bernard. 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 Good
Uh, what class of horse are these, uh, Mr. Wright? Uh, this is a class of general purpose horses. Mm -hmm. This is uh, representative of the farm horses here in uh, Prince Edward Island, I think. I see. They're certainly uh, yeah. strong-looking beasts. Just what, uh, what would the judges be looking for in, in, uh, in grading these? Well, they look for... Uh, it's just a general purpose type that they're, they're looking mm -hmm. for here. Mm -hmm. And they look for soundness, of course. And that's uh, one of the main things in any class of horses is soundness. This is the famous pulling contest, one of the highlights of the fair. There are four teams entered in the event this year. And this particular type of event is unique to this fair. It's the only one on the island where horses are used in the pulling contest. You understand in other places they do use tractors. The idea here is that the team must pull the runners with the cement blocks on a distance of five feet. And they keep adding blocks until the team is stopped. Well, I'm sorry we didn't get that ice cream. I guess they were sold out, eh? Little too cool, too. Well, Fred, do you see everything? I think I saw most of it, Father. Well, I hope you're not forgetting the dance. Oh, no. Evening. I'll have time to go home and uh, change my shirt, oh, will yes. I? We want you to be there for that. Fine. Oh, well, yes. I'll be seeing you shortly then, That's eh? That's great. Yeah. Send a few more of these, I might be able to square dance myself someday. I think you should try it. It's great fun, you know. Yes, it certainly looks like it. Well, Fred, now it's getting a little late, and I think I should be moving around. Hmm? I sure hope you come around these parts. You'll call in to see us. I certainly will. Thanks for all your help, Father. Goodbye, Fred. All right. Well, the dancing is going into the last lap here, and uh, another country fair is just about over. I suppose very shortly the farmers and housewives of the district will be worrying about next year's fair and wondering how they can make it bigger and better than ever. This is Fred Davis saying goodbye to you from Egmont Bay, Prince Edward Island. On the Spot is a production of the National Film Board. The films were directed by Julian Biggs and Rollo Gamble and produced by Robert Anderson. The narrator was Fred Davis, photography was by Eugene Boyko, and the sound by Chester Beechel.